Hey, are you ready to grow your business? You have checked out the number one resource for business leaders, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and managers. And we're going to teach you how to grow and scale your business with real actionable steps. There's no fluff in this podcast. It's just good advice. Check out this episode. If you're a first-time listener, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy this episode, leave us a five-star review. On today's episode, we have Brian Fritton, who's the CEO and founder of Havoc Shield. It's the perfect security solution for your small business. Find out more at HavocShield.com. Stay tuned and enjoy this episode. Here comes your good advice. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. You're checking out the number one resource if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business founder, if you're a startup owner. This is the place where we're going to give you good, tangible, and practical advice. And we're excited to have you here today. Today, we're sitting down with a, a person who's doing something that I think many of you will be pretty intrigued by. It's a it's something that a lot of us don't realize we need until we don't have it until we until we actually do need it right and so we're talking about cybersecurity today we're talking to Brian Fritton today he's the CEO and founder of Havoc Shield it is the all-in-one cybersecurity solution built for small businesses it's kind of like TurboTax but for cybersecurity and you can find out more at havocshield.com Brian it's great to have you here today thanks a ton for having me Blake appreciate it now, where are you calling in from today? Uh, warm and sunny Chicago. <laughs> I used to be in Los Angeles, so I'm, I channel the 70 degrees and sunny through the through the winter in my mind just to keep uh, keep sane. Sir, sure. my brother used to live in Chicago, and he said like the winter time period, like when you when you like pass someone on the the street corner, he said you don't even look at like everyone's just trying to get like back to yep. inside somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think winter is a special place in my heart in Chicago, though, and in, in, in non-pandemic times because uh it makes the summer that much sweeter and makes sure everyone gets along because you gotta you gotta you know you used to have to pack into trains and uh you know drive through uh slippery traffic on your way to whatever you, you just gotta tolerate each other a lot <laughs> and so it, it creates this like you know good midwestern vibe uh, in the rest of the seasons i got you now did i did i read correctly you're from Mich- michigan originally yeah, originally from Michigan. Uh, okay. Last startup that I started and exited was uh, was in Los Angeles, and then uh, I like the types of companies and the the venture capital ecosystem uh, mm-hmm. here in the Midwest a lot better. Family's closer, so I ended up moving back. Yeah, yeah. So, what was your your first company that you successfully exited? Uh, it was a real estate crowdfunding company called Patch of Land. Uh, so we took the like the That's Kickstarter model. Thanks. Yeah, everybody gets their own little patch of land. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we took the Kickstarter model of investing fractionally in large projects, right? So you want to raise $100,000 for some project or whatever it might be. And everyone kicks in $100, $1,000, whatever that might be. And uh, and you participate in that project. So uh, we, uh, my brother and I uh, co-founded it. We're looking at the time that, you know, uh, we both had a little bit of extra money and we're starting to figure out, hey, we're, we're getting older and we got to figure out where to invest uh, these types of things. And real estate was you know, the, the first identifiable, reliable way to really build wealth, um, and still is for a lot of people, but it's traditionally a, a really hard asset class to access, right? You got to have money, mm-hmm. uh, you got to know people, you got to have experience and all that sort of stuff. So we built a, a marketplace where we were, uh, giving loans to, you know, fix and flip rehabbers, uh, people who were doing this all day long, very professional, but not the type of you know uh, larger developer profile that can get easy loans from from the banks, uh, and uh, so they they were looking at hard money, which is what it was called, uh, which is expensive stuff and sometimes can be predatory. So there was a definite need there, and you know we wanted uh, normal people to be able to access that that asset class. You know your 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 mothers and your fathers and dentists and software engineers and whoever that might be. So we. Uh, we created the other side of the marketplace and you can kind of check out on Amazon investing in real estate type of mm. attitude. 
Yeah, interesting. Now, talk to me about what you're working on now with Havoc Shield. Yeah, uh, so you got to write like uh, it's basically TurboTax for for small business cybersecurity. Uh, it's a personal pain story. Uh, you know, was a CTO and, and co-founder, then later a VP of engineering uh, at a uh, uh, data science software company that worked heavily in Fortune 500 and the political space. Um, in uh, Apache land, I was defending the company from all types of attacks because we were passing a few million dollars to the wire every day and uh, getting poked because of it. Um, and then at the, the role with the, the data science software maker, inherited IT and got put in charge of cybersecurity in front of the 2018 midterm elections. And uh, that was a time where we hosted about nine out of every 10 progressive democratic political data strategy hubs in our software. So we had a we had the data that, you know, uh, lots of uh, lots of interesting uh, actors wanted access to. So mm. we get really serious about our cybersecurity program. Um, but in in both of those companies, both of those instances, you know, small time companies, you know, I think it was 50 people and then about 120 people, no security staff to speak of. Um, but we're, you know, uh, we're risking a lot by not having a professional cybersecurity program. And we're actually starting to, to lose deals because our customers were asking more from us sooner mm -hmm. uh, for good reason. Um, and uh, I had no actual real uh, dedicated experience in security, but uh, but we had to do it. So going through the pain of how do I build this myself, uh, paying for consultants, waiting for them to become available, sure. uh, figuring out how to prioritize this thing. Uh, it was just obvious that, you know, uh, we needed to take this ocean of complexity and, and, and make it into something that uh, your, your, your startup, your small business, mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of these requirements being placed on them could, could access. Now you guys, I mean, it, it, you had sort of like this moment of like the data we're holding on to. I mean, as you put it, it's it's intriguing data for a number of actors. Um, pretty pretty serious data. Uh, the average business owner doesn't always find themselves holding something with at uh, in some ways at um, you know, there, there's a lot of implications that can be that data can be used for. Yep. And not, the average business owner doesn't always have that. And so they don't always have the impetus of like, oh, we really need to get that cybersecurity company. And I would argue it's it's why a lot of small business owners act too late. It's why I mentioned it in the intro is that many times when we think of cybersecurity, we think of either one, oh, that's, that's for the big dogs. That's for like the really large companies. Or two, that's for... Um, you know, really special data. You know, I just have basic customer data. I mean, why would someone want to steal that? You see what I'm right. saying? And so yep. how have you guys, especially since your niche is small business owners, how have you guys helped the average small business owner, maybe even people who are listening to this podcast, understand the importance of what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had thought that in, in years past as well. Um, couple of things. The reality of uh, the types of attacks that you'll face as a small business uh, is not that you know they're only going after the large guys, they're only going after the sensitive guys. Um, there are a number of reports out there, you know, credible stuff, Verizon, Ponemon Institute, uh, you know, a bunch of different reports that have studied this uh, and found that over 50% of the time now, um, it used to be 43% of the time, it used to be about 50, 50, now it's over 50% of the time, uh, successful attacks happen against companies with less than 500 employees versus your your larger counterparts. And the types of techniques that these attackers, and when I say attackers, this is everyone from, you know, state sponsored, super advanced types of folks down to the teenager with access to open source tools and, and, and yeah, or sure. night, night, right? Yeah. Um, the, the types of attacks that a lot of these folks are putting out there uh, are what you call like spray and pray types of attacks. So uh, they're using open source, high volume tools to sort of go out and see what websites, what networks, what people are vulnerable um, and launching attacks uh, in mass. And that data comes back. And more often than not, it's the small businesses hosting on WordPress that haven't updated their computers, that left their networks open, that have employees that aren't trained well that are showing up on their list of possible targets. 
And those attackers certainly will prioritize you at the top of their list of, you know, okay, how do I exploit this? How do I get further into that business? Uh, and so you as a small business without the resources are showing up on these lists uh, and getting prioritized for future sort of attacks against you. And then if you don't have the, uh, the, 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 the elements of a security program in place, it's much more likely they're going to be able to get in and mm -hmm. they get in. Can you recover from that? And these attackers know it, right? Like they know you're a squishy target and they know they can get a hundred of these small businesses and they can take yeah, their credit card information, their customer lists and sell those. Uh, they know that they can uh, use your websites and your properties and your people for nefarious you know, reasons. They know they can get you to, you know, uh, wire uh, payments to the wrong vendors by using some tricky techniques. It does not take some sensitive info, mm. uh, some specialized type of uh, setup for you to be an attractive target. It takes uh, not having good security hygiene to be an attractive target. Um, the, the second thing uh, is... Uh, it is uh, fast becoming a requirement of customers and regulators, right? And so right. Uh, if you don't have your stuff together uh, and you're selling to regulated markets, you're selling to larger customers, uh, or more, more, more often you're selling to customers who themselves are uh, uh, security conscious in one way or another, they're looking at you as a small vendor, as a security threat. And so it's a revenue problem now. If you can't yeah. answer questions if you can't prove your your efforts there you're not going to win the deal or at least it's going to slow it down yeah well that's definitely a a great explanation for why the small business owner should care about their cybersecurity uh, what's it like i mean we have people listen to the podcast by the way who are they're entrepreneurs or startup founders uh, a, a lot of us are just trying to keep our our first business alive especially yeah. during covid you have started a business, you successfully exited that business, which congratulations. That's I think that's just such a great achievement for anyone in the startup world. And now you, you've started Havoc Shield, which you started back in 2019 with a million and a half dollars in seed money. I mean, that, this is really impressive stuff. Tell me about your backstory. I mean, have you have you been? Is this one of those like you know you had the lemonade stand at nine or ten years old? I mean, yeah. how did you get into the world of entrepreneurship, startup world, um, and especially the the venture capital world? I'm I'm really curious about your backstory. Yeah, I mean, it's been a roller coaster ride, man, and I think it will always be. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit of a masochist for just like <laughs> like do this as we all are, right? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, very early age, um, my brother who I started a couple of companies with, um, was very entrepreneurial. So I kind of followed in his footsteps to an extent. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the rubber kind of hit the road pretty early on when I was in high school and my mom said, you gotta go get a job. You can't just sit around for the summer playing video games or doing, <laughs> yeah, doing whatever. Sure. And, uh, I was privileged enough to have a computer early on in my life and to, to be interested in that and to be encouraged at, you know, doing more, uh, uh, with, with computers. Um, and so, you know, I didn't want to go uh, get a job at McDonald's or something like that. And so, uh, I was sort of perusing what I could, what I could do on the computer and, and it happened by like our, our local rural Michigan radio station website. I was like, Oh, this is crap. This is, this needs to be improved. And so I, I reached out over their like contact form and said, I'll, I'll do a new website for you for 200 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really underpriced myself, but, um, did you, did you self teach like HTML, all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. like, these are like Dreamweaver days. Oh yeah. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. Really yeah. Raw, raw HTML types of stuff. I was, you know, I was buying templates and just kind of figuring out how to hack them together and, and learned, you know, yeah what software libraries are and stuff like that through, through those types of things. Um, but yeah, he, he let me and, uh, uh, I cut my teeth on client management projects and pricing and all that stuff because he, uh, he ended up owning a bunch of radio stations throughout the Midwest, uh, and a couple other businesses. Uh, and so that brought me into college and that's how I paid my way through college for the most part is just doing websites for people. Um, and then I had a, a business that I raised some angel money for out of college um, after, uh, you know, ingraining myself sort of in the entrepreneurial circles here in Chicago. I went to DePaul University um, and uh, there I learned like uh, unit economics <laughs> being one of the most important pieces of, uh, of e-commerce businesses. Uh, and that's kind of what we were doing at the time. We had a 
tech supply and uh, uh, office supply drop shipping business. Um, and uh, so, what, what what year is this, by the way? I'm sorry. What year is oh, this that year? you had the office supply drop shipping business? In 2010. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we were we had written some some clever software that was working with the larger distributors like you know, Tech Data, Ingram Micro, those types of folks. And uh, we're pulling all their catalogs together and would uh, would create one order based on the best price you could get from each one of these things. We would just you know ship ship uh, ship the the aggregate order from a bunch of different distributors, getting you the best price you could get. And uh, uh, yeah, we got the unit economics wrong, where we were uh, we were basically losing money on on every sale, and we we you know started to recognize this and trying to rectify it but uh but it, it was too late so that was my first failed business and mm. it got to the point where uh it got to the point where uh you know i was working in like a share space downtown chicago at the time and it was like midnight after a long long day trying to figure out what to what to do with this business and uh i had already expended all my my personal resources to kind of keep it afloat and keep myself afloat i, I beat my train card on the the carousel to get in home about seven miles north of the city. And I said, insufficient funds. I was like, oh crap. Uh, so I went to try to refill my card and nope, cards maxed out. So I walked seven miles home at about midnight uh, to get home. And uh, at that point I said, you know, like I got to reestablish myself and set up some new boundaries between my personal life and my business. Uh, I think that's really important learning that I had from, from that. So I worked a couple of jobs for a couple of years and then, you know, the bug bit again with patch of land and, uh, took those learnings and uh, yeah. got it right that time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, there is a lot, there's so much like emotional investment that goes into starting your business. Um, and, you know, for many of us as entrepreneurs, stepping onto that journey is also very like symbolic, I guess, of like, I guess, sort of like your own destiny and control and all these other things that, you know, in some like less sexy ways, it's like, well, I just don't want to work for someone. So I'm gonna go do this. Yeah. But regardless, there's a lot of emotional energy attached to it, as you know. Um, and so when the writing gets on the wall or the business fails, it could be a real gut punch. Um you know, I'm curious, how did you, how did you mentally get over that? Totally. Um, well, the hard way, right? Like <laughs> figuring out that that is the case. Um, I had, like, I should acknowledge that I had a couple of people in my life from a professional and personal, uh, uh, perspective that helped me through it. Right. Uh, helped me see the light that, you know, like you'll get another chance. You're young, uh, you know, uh, take care of yourself, find out what your floor is. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think, um, you know, moving through a lot of the, the days, weeks and months thereafter and kind of processing, uh, uh, that event, what it taught me is like, it, you know, your business is not your life and nor should it be. Uh, and that's coming from like, a guy who has done this over and over again now to success and failure and mm -hmm. a couple million dollars. Like this is, this is my, my way of doing things. Um, but, uh, establishing your, I think your boundaries. Um, and for me, uh, it was, um, that financial boundary. I'm never going to put myself in a position again where my personal credit cards are maxed out. I can't afford the train ride home. And, you know, I don't know how I'm going to eat the next day. Right? <laughs> uh, sure. like, uh, I I've set up my, financial modeling, I've set up my drop dead dates, I've set up my fundraising events, all of that stuff for businesses since then to make sure that I know where that event is. I know where that floor is. I know what I will and won't invest. I know when I will take additional risks and re-up. Um, but it's really just kind of trying to, I think, create those boundaries, at least for me ahead of time and knowing when you're getting close to hitting them and how to take those corrective actions. But uh that's that's the tactical side of it. I think the the emotional side was all people, all my community, right? Mm -hmm. It was like be vulnerable. Um, you're, everyone's going to fail in the entrepreneurial world, whether it's big and explosive or you know small and just yourself, and you tried something and it didn't work. It still hurts, and uh, you got to talk to people about it and 
by talking to people and being vulnerable about it, you get the same in return, right? Like you get people telling you their stories and you get a lot more empathy, you get people checking on you and giving you new opportunities because they know you want to learn something mm-hmm. in the future. Um, uh, and again, it's like, uh, I think a lot of people in the Midwest, especially, you know, grow up with the stoicism, uh, uh, kind of built in ingrained in their personalities. And you just, you have to be more open and transparent about what you're going through. And, uh, if it gets bad enough, uh, take a step back, like moving slow to move fast is so underrated. Having a couple of days, like everything's blowing up around you. I mm-hmm. feel like you take a day off. It's just like, that's the last thing you'd want to do. No, it's probably the first thing you actually should do. No, that's good. Yeah. It almost feels like that vulnerability is really hard in today's social media age, which is, you know, everyone's, everyone's sharing about all the amazing accolades their businesses is getting. Um, I've even seen some people share, you know, social media posts about like how amazing the business in, is. And then 30 days later, they're shutting the business down. Yeah. Um, I've had conversations with people who they, you know, I asked the, the, you know, just general friends, like in the entrepreneurial space where I'll be like, you know, how's business going? They're like, oh, it's amazing. It's so great. And then I talk to them 30 days later and it's like, oh yeah, we've been bleeding cash for six months. And so, and I don't necessarily fault them for that. It's kind of the world we live in, right? Is that, that vulnerability you're talking about, it's almost like there's this direct line with credibility. And um, it, it almost feels like people are now like they, they fail and fail and fail year after year after year. And then like that eighth year, they finally like turn a corner, become successful. And they just tell like that tiny little piece of the yeah. story. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah. your advice is really great. It's, 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 you're so right. And um, I think it's a bit of an opt in culture, honestly, to be vulnerable. And what I mean by that is um, one of the trends that I like that's really popular right now in social media and probably mostly on Twitter is like what they call building in public. And, you know, you see a lot of these um, founders come out and, you know, expose what, uh, what, what money they're making, what challenges they're facing, what deals they lost and you know, what's next for them. And, you know, it's kind of this, this updating thread that you can, you can follow. And uh, you will find there are lots of investors who dislike that. They want that, like, that, oh yeah, like you, know, you, you had an exit before and it was a you made it turn around in just 30 days. Uh, you're going to get investors that say, okay, no, you've been an experienced founder what did you learn from those events? Um, I can follow your track of learning. I can see your speed of iteration. Uh, and I know that you're not going to, you know, it's, it's so, it's so much, uh, less likely that that's going to happen again to you, uh, uh, because you're aware of it. You're aware of yourself, you have that personal awareness. And so you'll get investors that opt in specifically because of your vulnerability in your, in your, uh, your, your willingness to be emotionally intelligent about your business. Um, you'll get employees who will opt in because of your emotional intelligence about how to run the business and what's mm. important to you. You'll get customers that opt in because of it too. Yeah. So whenever you, just to change the subject slightly, um, whenever you went and started Patch of Lands and you had worked a couple of jobs, you had had sort of like this um, like decompressing time, were you cautious were you nervous were you just thrilled to get back into the entrepreneurial game i mean what was going across your mind uh i was really excited um like i think it is like the the the, the people like us who start businesses like it is kind of that bug like it is as i said earlier it's a bit masochistic like why would you ever do this <laughs> um and everyone has their different reasons, whether that be control or money or flexibility or whatever it might be. But um, I was really excited. Uh, it was a good idea. I was certainly more careful about identifying uh, the resources necessary before I stepped into it. Um, uh, and my brother and I did that by working nights and weekends at an incubator here in Chicago uh, for months and months before you know, we pulled the, pulled the trigger to kind of go full time at it. And we only pulled the trigger to go full time at it when we found an investor who had seen what we were doing and reached out and uh, wanted to do a deal. And uh, we only did a deal when we could identify that we could make a minimum amount of salary that would support us doing it. And that we had run that out 
from a financial point of view to say, okay, that means we have this many months and do we think we can achieve it, you know, in that period of time before raising mm-hmm. another round or getting to profitability or whatnot. So we had done that diligence and that uh, cautiousness, that diligence um, gave us even more excitement, right? Like, okay, mm-hmm. cool. like we're going to be able to provide for our families. We're going to be able to successfully kind of go at this. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, yeah, I was just all excitement from there. And I think the nerves are always, <laughs> the nerves always come, but I don't know, it just, uh, it's just part of the game, right? Yeah. Kind of nervous energy and knowing how to channel that is part of the, part of the job. I really appreciate your, you call it diligence, but just even like your, um, being so intentional on the numbers and, um, kind of getting in, in the weeds of how the business would operate. Cause it does feel like many times people, when they step into the world of entrepreneurship or, um, you know, becoming a startup founder that there's like this, um, and it's not bad, but it's like this, this, I think entrepreneurship is, entrepreneurship is attractive to creators and creative types. And so there's sort of like this whimsical nature to it. There's like this, you know, the world is yours to conquer. It's like very imaginative, like what can happen. And it feels like whenever I have conversations with people and I, I'm not necessarily trying to bring them back down to, to earth, but when I ask those questions about profitability and what are you going to pay yourself and all these things, I, I've even had people tell me like, man, you're really killing the entrepreneurial vibe. Um, so I just, I appreciate your story because you're, you're talking about how, Hey, you know, entrepreneurship isn't just about like this sexy starting your own business type of thing, but it's, it's literally business ownership in running a business. And there has to be systems and intentionality in place to do that. Well, yeah, I absolutely. I mean, I, I see both sides of it and, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing unless I enjoyed at a aggregate level doing it. Right. Um, and, uh, I certainly love as like a software engineer type product type. I love the days that I get to get in and mess around and wireframe and maybe write a little bit of code and do stuff like that. And I still do that, uh, uh, you know, uh, a couple of days at minimum every month so that I have that, uh, and, at a higher level, you know, like the, the mission is different than the strategy and, uh, your mission stays, uh, you know, throughout all of the different changing, uh, positioning you use the pivots that you might go through all that sort of stuff and the very necessary, uh, elements of, you know, financial projections, focusing on problem and, and mapping that to how you're going to solve it and all that sort of good stuff. Um, but yeah, you gotta enjoy your, your you gotta enjoy your mission and know what that is. The 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 thing that I I, I say to people when we talk about this, and, I, and I'm still to the point learning how to do this myself, is like your your uh, your impact on the world, your mission uh, uh, is not well served if you go off the cuff with it. And uh, yeah, you're gonna have days where you don't really like doing what you're doing. Uh, where it feels boring, you feel like you're not progressing your mission because you're in Excel developing a financial model. <laughs> sure. right? That might be, but that financial model gives you the tolerances of your business and exposes new ways to achieve your mission and r- helps you recognize this is the way that I can get my mission achieved faster. Right? If I just right. change this, this is the the lever changes, the numbers are exponential. Right? Like your discoveries through going through some of these. Um, tactical necessary pieces uh, are going to save you from the the dead pile of, of businesses, which were clever, intelligent ideas started by clever, intelligent people uh, who didn't go through the the steps necessary. And even if you do, lots of them fail. So, like, give yourself the better chances of achieving your mission, uh, and you'll get more time to to prove out that passion. There's a great soundbite. I mean, that's such great advice. Um, and I think it's, it's for those of you who are listening, it's, it's great advice in terms of how you're being intentional with your business. Um, speaking of mission, Brian, w- what's the mission of Havoc Shield? Where are you taking this thing? Yeah, uh, we want to be the reason why a million small businesses 
uh, survive and thrive after their cyber attack. And it's very specific where it's more a question of when, not if. Uh, and that's moving from a reactive, it doesn't happen to us stance to a proactive, it's going to happen stance. And that's the reality of it. And so um, by putting in a professional program, you know, using what we're doing today, uh, the, the ways that we do this might change, but the mission sort of stays the same. Uh, uh, you know, you can lessen the chances that you will be attacked. Um, you can identify when it does happen sooner and you'll be able to recover from it uh, much more quickly and cost effectively uh, than if you than if you had. Certainly we want to prevent attacks, but we don't we don't make that our mission because we believe that uh, good the, the best thing that we can do for small businesses uh, mm. is to make them resilient to one. And uh, and at the end of the day, um, we're doing that because small businesses are um, the globe's uh, largest provider of jobs. And if one goes out of business, uh, you know, that's that those jobs are lost forever. And uh, if that keeps happening to small businesses, remember more often than it's happening to larger businesses that have the resources, then those jobs get lost and lost and lost. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of connected to making sure that we protect people. And that's, that's back to the security thing is like, we're just really interested in keeping people uh, safe and in business. Mm -hmm. Now, Brian, speaking of, of jobs, I know you have almost a dozen employees that are working in your business. Are you guys remote or do you have an office in Chicago or? Yeah, we're wholly remote. We got people in Florida and uh, New York and Michigan, mm -hmm. Chicago here. And, I, I love having people like you on the podcast because um, I just, I'm so immersed in conversations with people who are like, because you know, as you know, there's there's a lot of chatter in the um, the hiring world right now, and especially coming out of COVID, where many people were temporarily remote. But um, I was talking to someone who said uh, who runs a business who said, you know, remote just just doesn't work from a management standpoint. And so it's always great having someone like you on who literally what you run is a business that is remote employees. W what's that like? What's it like managing people who are all over the country? Yeah, I, the, the idea that you can't run a successful business from all these bullshit. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's so many examples out of it. Uh, but there, uh, there really are. You're right, actually. Uh, so many examples of even businesses that have become billion dollar businesses that have been fully remote. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, though. Continue. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, I mean, the, it's a different, you have to run it differently. Uh, you can't expect people to show up and be there nine to five and look over their shoulder and, um, uh, I have a level of respect for sure for getting people in the same room and having those sort of uh, collaborative environments, but those are replicable and those are replicable uh, digitally as well as on a different cadence in person. So we are certainly not the type of business, uh, nor are the people who do this right, the types of attitudes where you're never going to meet the person that you work with in person. They do uh, biannual retreats. They pay for you to go visit your team in a city that most of you are located in and have an offsite. Um, you know, they incentivize you going and meeting the people that are, are, are near you and have those sort of um, social interactions. Uh, and those are, I think, uh, quite necessary, but it doesn't have to be in the normal uh, timeline of your day at work. In fact, there's lots of arguments that say it shouldn't be. Um, the uh, attitude that we take and we modeled it after Zapier um, for the folks that might know them, Wade Foster and, and Brian Helmig and those folks that started it over there. They have a great manifesto and set of docs on starting, a, starting and running a remote company. Um, uh, the, the synthesis of, of it is like we're an outcome oriented company. And I don't care if you are here from nine to five or uh, 10 to six or uh, whatever your hours might be, what a time zone you might be in. Uh, we get really, really serious on a regular basis about quarterly, sometimes more often about our one or two focus areas. And everybody in the company knows those. And everybody knows what projects we're working on and what the milestones are. And we hold ourselves accountable in achieving those milestones. And uh, 
if we're achieving those milestones, we know what success looks like. We know what the metrics that we're producing are look like, and we know if we're on track by looking at those metrics. Mm-hmm. If we're not on track, then uh, we're going to call uh, on our on our company, on our on our team members to ch- change something. And sometimes we have to work really hard uh, to to get to those points. And sometimes we don't achieve them, and we need to reevaluate. But uh, by focusing on just a couple core things and saying here's the milestones and here's the timeline at which we need to pace to achieve those things. And here's how we're tracking that people show up. People are adults. They'll do the work and it makes it so much easier to manage those people Mm -hmm. uh, because they're either doing the work that contributes to that or they're not. And I don't care if they're here, you know, Tuesday through Thursday, or they took a day off and they're working a Sunday. It just doesn't matter. (laughs) Yeah. And I like what you said too, about, you know, your team members are adults uh, cause I've heard some, some managers or leaders or whatever say, you know, well, you know, how can I trust them if they're not in the office? And I'm like, well, why did you hire them? If, yeah. <laughs> if that's really what you think about them. So yeah. no, that's great advice. Really? Well, Brian, we are about out of time, uh, for people who want to know more about Havoc Shield, I'm assuming they should go to the website. Um, and then if people want to connect with you directly, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, yeah, website's there. Um, we uh, we have a special deal for anyone listening to the podcast, uh, so we'll make sure to email that like to you afterwards for the for the show notes. Uh, but uh, but certainly can go to the website. There's a free trial there, uh, and you know, uh, like I said earlier, we're really really serious about protecting uh, other small business founders and their 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 teams. Uh, and if that means just having a conversation about what security should mean to you, uh, what stage you should be at. Uh, customer or not, uh, I want to have that conversation with you. And uh, and so it's just Brian, B-R-I-A-N at HavocShield.com. Great. Brian, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thanks a ton, Blake. This is great. Hey, for you guys who are listening, I'm going to put HavocShield.com down in the episode description below. And also, I will be make I will make sure to also include that deal if you are ready to jump into the world of getting your business covered in terms of your cybersecurity needs. I'll also make sure I hook you up with that as well. Um, and you can also, if I don't put it in the show notes, I can also email it to you. Just email me, Blake, at goodadvicecoaching.com. Hey, if this is your first episode you're listening to, what the heck are you waiting on? Click that subscribe button so we can keep getting you good advice wherever you are. And don't forget, if you want to support the podcast, you can do it at our Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash good advice. And we'll be continuing to bring you good advice throughout the 2022 year. Thanks for listening. That's today's good advice. We'll catch you later. See ya.